my parents are Hindu by background, but they, they come from India. Um, they emigrated by way of Bahrain to the UK to the United States. And uh, you know, the last panel was very, was very much a wake up call, I would say, to this whole pro the multicultural project and assimilation. And th it's happening also in the United States, I will say, just as a way of responding to that last panel, where multiculturalism has, has impeded the assimilation of Americans into American society and has, has kind of prevented uh, many immigrant uh, Muslim and non-Muslim from, from pr looking at themselves as Americans. I mean, everyone's a hyphenated American now, an Indian American or uh, you know, wherever you happen to be from. And it wasn't that case when I was growing up in the 1970s and, and 1980s. Um, you were just perceived to be American and becoming an American was, was something you were very proud of. And um, I think that's a very big problem for, for the West in general and it's re reflected in the lack of confidence in the principles and in the history um, of the West. And I think a lot of this has to do with Christianity. So this is going to be my, my, my talk uh, for you this afternoon. Um, the problem with Christianity in Europe and, and liberalism is, is very much at the, at the center of this. And the professor in the last session very much gave us the thin understanding of the relationship between uh, religion and liberalism that the, the minimal understanding of religion, as long as you don't do no harm to anyone and you're, you're religious is a private affair, um, that's okay. But the minute you start to make any public claims, any truth claims, any transcendental, transcendental claims, um, it becomes politically dangerous. And I think for Christianity, it's, it's very hard to become, to be a Christian without making any kind of truth claims, without making any kind of claims for the good of your neighbor. Um, part, of, part of Christianity is not only love of God, but love of neighbor. And love of neighbor involves something about the state of his soul. And, it's, and again, a very privatized religion um, is, is a problem. And I think Christianity from its existence, from its beginnings, has uh, come under the sword for this very reason. Um, and I'll get into the, the similarities and differences with Islam in a few minutes. But I, I'm just returned from a conference in Rome which was about this very problem, the problem of, of the persecution of Christians, and it was called Under Caesar's Sword. And um, I'll give you some, some data, some numbers about how big a problem this is, even though many people in the West are completely unaware of it. The Pew Research Center estimates that 76 of the world's population, 76% of the world's population lives in a religiously repressive country. 76%, obviously. Places like China and India add, add a lot to that. Um, persecution is a subset of religious freedom violations and often entails the use of egregiously coercive or outwardly violent methods to achieve such prohibitions, restrictions, or punishments. Some of these methods include detention, interrogation, forced labor, imprisonment, beating, torture, quote unquote disappearance, forced flight from homes, enslavement, rape, murder, execution, attacks on and destruction of churches, or credible th threats to carry out such actions. Now this persecution can be carried out um, either by the state or by uh, societal actors. Am I hearing an echo? Oh, that's probably it. <laughs> um, either by the state or societal actors, including terrorists and religious extremists. Uh, the m majority of persecution that this Pew study uh, examined is carried out by the state, hence the name Caesar's Sword. But the study um, does not ex ignore countries in which societal persecution is high, for example, in India, Egypt, Syria, and Pakistan. Now, the International Society for Human Rights, which is a secular NGO based in Frankfurt, estimated that in 2009, that Christians are the victims of 80 percent. Let me repeat that. Christians are the victims of 80 percent of all acts of religious discrimination in the world, a finding that is corroborated, corroborated by several, separate, several excuse me, human rights observatories. Christians are the only religious group that is persecuted in all 16 of the countries highlighted as egregious offenders by the United States Commission on, on International Religious Freedom in 2012. The Pew Research Center's 2014 report found that between January 2006 and December 2012, Christians faced harassment and intimidation in 151 countries. 
the largest number of any religious group. An important but disputed statistic is that the number of Christians who are killed for their faith every year. The most widely cited number is that of Gordon Cronwell Theological Seminary's Todd Johnson, who, who worked with David Barnett until his recent death. And they estimated that in 2010, 178,000 Christians have been killed per year over the previous decade. Other analysts object that Johnson overcounts by including deaths of Christians that were not likely motivated by religious hostility. For instance, those in the recent war in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Thomas Schurmacher estimated in 2011 that 7,300 is probably a more accurate number of Christians who have been killed for their faith annually in recent years. Whatever the result of this dispute, the number of Christians who die for their faith remain high. Even with the lower estimate, 20 Christians are being killed for their faith each day, year in and year out. Not only is the persecution of Christians large in scale, it is also increasing. The Pew Research Center reported that in 2012, religious persecution around the world had reached a six-year high. Roughly the same trend held for Christians in particular. Christians suffer persecution in a strikingly wide variety of regimes and societies. Only in the past decade, for instance, Christian communities have been persecuted in countries as diverse as Syria, Egypt, Iraq, Israel, Russia, Nigeria, Tanzania, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, China, and India. Contrary to widespread belief, it is not only Islamist regimes in Muslim-majority countries that have applied growing pressure on Christian communities. Some of these regimes are inspired by ethno-religious nationalism, as in Buddhist-majority Sri Lanka and Hindu-majority India, while others are animated by a brand of secular authoritarianism, as in China. Christian persecution merits focus not only because it is widespread and increasing, but also because it is underreported and insufficiently recognized. A recent spate of books on the persecution of Christians has helped to alleviate the problem. Still, the phenomenon lacks adequate attention even among groups whose natural mission it is, is to recognize it, namely human rights advocacy organizations. In addition, media attention remains scanty. Only a handful of Western journalists devote regular attention to the issue. As a result, secular journalist and world affairs commentator Jeffrey Goldberg recently observed that Christian persecution, especially in the Middle East, is one of the, quote, under, one of the most under-recovered stories in international news, unquote. Even more curious is the fact that only a small minority of Christian parishes and congregations in the religiously free part of the world give concentrated attention to their co-religionists who are persecuted. Rare is the church with an adult education class, for instance, on today's martyrs or on the endangered Christians overseas. Recently, some church authorities have called for increased attention to global persecution. Leading these calls for increased engagement is Pope Francis, who has repeatedly emphasized the need for all people of goodwill to stand in solidarity with Christians and people of other faiths facing persecution worldwide. Now, all of that is from the research that we presented at the Rome Conference, um, which is available. If you Google under Caesar's sword, um, it comes up at, as under the University of Notre Dame's website, and you'll see more on this project. They had something like 15 researchers engaging in two years' worth of research to, to give you an idea of how widespread um, the persecution of Christians is. Now, how are Christians supposed to respond to persecution? There historically and typically have been three uh, ways of responding. One is endurance or perseverance. Um, we cannot forget that Jesus called the persecuted blessed. Um, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And that there is obviously a positive aspect to martyrdom in the Christian faith. Uh, we are told to pray for our persecutors. Uh, if you think about it, the, the ultimate Christian response would be to take the place of somebody who is being persecuted. Uh, we think of St. Maximilian Kolbe, who in, in the concentration camps of Auschwitz gave himself up rather than having the father of a family be killed. And um, he was proclaimed a saint for that. The second response to persecution, of course, is resistance, which can take many forms, uh, legal, political, military, uh, especially on the behalf of others. Now, there are many uh, human rights organizations that are supposed to be focusing on uh, religious freedom and religious persecution, 
Uh, many of them tend to focus on non-Christian groups, however, and I'll, I'll try to get to some of the reasons why I think that's the case. And the third response to persecution, of course, is flight, um, to simply leave a place where you're no longer free. Um, but of course, this means that there may no longer be a Christian presence in the Holy Land and Middle East. Now, the complicated history of the Catholic Church um, on religious freedom probably adds to the silence on religious persecution. Christians have been persecutors and are now the persecuted. So in a way, this looks like, like payback in the postmodern multicultural uh, equation. But the Catholic Church itself, um, which was quite slow to recognize religious freedom, um, is now celebrating the 50th anniversary of Vatican II's declaration, Dignitatis Humanae, which um, takes a very uh, philosophical approach um, as well as a theological approach to religious freedom, that you know, there is no coercion when it comes to religion and that individuals cannot be coerced into believing something. And this is something unique to Christianity, the focus on belief. Um, you may be able to force me to act a certain way, you may be able to prevent me from doing certain things, but you cannot coerce a belief. Um, but this, of course, raises um, a whole series of questions that, you know, within Christianity, we can separate faith from works. We can separate the temporal from the spiritual. Uh, we can go to gospel passages that tell us that Jesus himself said his kingdom is not of this world. Um, historically, that has not always been the case where the temporal and the spiritual are, are so separate. But it raises the question, especially here in Europe and in Hungary, um, what is a Christian polity? What is the Christian civilization? Um, we now live in a more secular age where religious freedom is the rule. Um, in places where religious uh, nationalism might become resurgent, you know, if I understand, Hungary is one of those places that the, the current government um, is interested in the resurgence of Christianity. I will add that this morning I went to Mass at uh, St. Stephen's Cathedral and I was very pleasantly surprised by the number of people at Mass at 7 a.m. in the morning. I did not expect to see that in what I considered to be a, a, a more secular uh, country. Um, that does not always bode well uh, when, it, when you have the intersection of, of politics and, and faith. Um, I think the Russian Orthodox Church can attest to some of those difficulties uh, and being instrumentalized by, uh, by politicians. Now, um, for Christians and, and Europeans who have a history of religious persecution, um, as I said, this, this appears to be payback time, uh, especially as the West becomes less Christian and more multicultural, not just in fact, but as an ideology, as, as the previous panel said. And, and political liberalism, as the professor said, uh, was meant to make religious indifference the rule, make religious differences less important, less willing to go to war over or to kill each other over. You end religious warfare by making martyrdom improbable or impossible. So the plight of the Middle Eastern Christians is even um, different than the, that of Europeans, of course. Uh, I, I have the sneaking suspicion, and, and I, I would say maybe even a fear, that the reason we hear so little about the suffering of Middle Eastern Christians is that they are too Christian for the left wing and too Arab for the right wing. Um, they have no basis of support in the West as a result. Now, what are some of the challenges of Islam? Um, like Christianity, it is, a, it is a universal proselytizing religion. It is not uh, limited to a certain people or a tribe. Uh, it believes in the law and in community, and it doesn't seem particularly well adapted to liberalism, um, as Catholicism hadn't been, um, especially when it comes to women and sexuality, which are, if I must put it, uh, seem to be the central tenets of the secular religion in, 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 in the West, in, Western Europe and in North America. Now the problem is that there is no spiritual authority who speaks for all of Islam. Um, they have no pope that can, uh, can, can, that can change the teaching very easily. Philosophy has never been uh, publicly or institutionally accepted as it has been in Catholicism, so the role of reason um, is quite different. Uh, the ability to think for yourself is not as, as respected. Uh, in Islam, it's much harder for a, a Locke or a Spinoza to appear. Um, that being said, the Acton Institute tries to find uh, religious and liberal thinkers all the time. 
we have a, a good friend in Turkey, Mustafa Akayol, who is trying to become that Muslim John Locke. And uh, you know, we, we saw him in Rome last week, and, and he was asked whether he has a bounty on his head. And he said, not yet in Turkey. But he said in other countries, he said if he was living in Syria or Iraq, he would be very afraid for his, for his life. So what will it take for the West to, to accept the, uh, the problem of persecuted Christians um, and to be able to do something about it? This is not an easy question to answer. One thing at, at the very least it could do is take religious liberty more seriously at home in order to advance it abroad. Um, but can it really do so? Once we've lost the faith in, in the Christian nation or a Christian civilization, can we still take religion seriously? And can we make distinctions among religions without engaging in religious warfare? Uh, just yesterday in the New York Times, Ross Dautat, the columnist, warned that uh, religious conservatives think that theology can never change, while liberals think, think that it always does. But there has to be a, a middle ground more reflective of, of reality. Um, for Christians, you know, people kind of go up and down between faith and, and non-faith and belief and unbelief. And, and the, internal, the inner life of a Christian is, is a very complicated thing to judge. Um, I'd like to just end with a recollection of Pope Benedict, Pope Emeritus Benedict, I should say. Um, when it came to the future of Europe, he warned about the dictatorship of relativism. And that was in 2005, just before his election to um, the papacy. Uh, a year later, he gave a, a quite famous or infamous speech at, in Regensburg, at the University of Regensburg in Germany, where he was um, criticized for his statements about, uh, about Islam, um, especially citing a Byzantine empire who said that no good comes from Islam but violence. It's spread by the sword. But it, what was lost in that larger uh, discussion initiated by Pope Benedict was that it was really about the role of theology and reason. Uh, what is the relationship between theology and philosophy and Islam? Uh, in the West, we've seen that uh, the university is an outgrowth of, of Christianity. The idea that you can have this kind of free inquiry, um, which of course was expanded and, and gained a lot more traction in the West, um, with the Enlightenment, but it really did have Christian roots uh, because Christianity did take uh, reason and philosophy uh, seriously, even independent of theology. Uh, so what kind of form will this take in, in when it comes to Islam? Uh, is there a philosophically acceptable way of questioning theology in, in Islam? And for Christianity, this is not just important when it comes to Islam itself, but for society. Because once you can get people starting to think about the coercion of faith, uh, the principles of religious freedom, and liberalism, you, know, you, you can actually start to come up with ideas that we can all agree on um, without uh, simply reverting to that thin understanding of religion. So in the end, you know, what, what's the end of the, of the game for, for Christians in the Middle East? Um, as I said, there are typically three responses to persecution, endurance, um, resistance and, and flight. And I think for those of us who are in Europe, um, you know, I know there's been a lot of controversy about the, the refugees coming from Syria and other places where they're being persecuted. But I know that many religious leaders have, have acted against their political authorities by saying that, look, we will take in refugees. And I think especially Christians um, deserve our support, if not necessarily in our, in our home countries, um, at least when it comes to doing what we can to ensure their safe passage, uh, refugee camps, wherever it might be, because they really are caught between a rock and a hard place when it comes to the Middle East. I, I was in Israel in September, and you know, the, the Arab Christians are really caught between Muslims on one hand and um, Israelis on the other hand, and they really are, are people without a home. And for Christians across the world, this may not seem such a big deal. We don't care as much about having the Holy Land under Christian auspices anymore. But um, at the same time, these are very important religious passions. And if we want to um, look out for Christian brothers and sisters in the Middle East, we're going to have to do much more than we have to this point. Um, but when it comes to like, the larger lessons, you know, there are many things that political liberalism promises when it comes to religion, um, religious passions. 
And one thing that the Act Institute tries to accomplish is push economics, free markets, um, these kind of economic liberalism that somehow can assimilate and give people more hope and opportunity. I'm a little bit skeptical that just economics will do it. It's going to require much more uh, moral and political uh, strength of will, I think, to accomplish these kind of things. But in the end, what it really shows, and this goes to the, the professor's uh, lecture earlier today, is that liberalism and religion really shouldn't be looked at as antagonistic towards each other, but as, but as, uh, as necessary components for a free society. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in what sense is it accurate to say in the middle of the second decade of the 21st century that the European continent is being raped, pillaged, and terrorized by the conduct of Mohammedans. Um, I do not make this statement in order to be controversial, contentious, or insensitive, even though the charity that I run is dedicated to ensuring that people who do make such statements are not murdered. Um, I do so because I consider it fitting to begin an address to an organization as august as the Hungarian of Academy of Sciences with a hypothesis. And I hope that by the end of my remarks, um, there will be an understanding that every single element of this hypothesis can be supported by an overwhelming uh, degree of evidence. And I hope um, also you will begin to understand why I chose to uh, name my presentation uh, from a quotation from the Archbishop of Estergom uh, from 1448. Uh, so really the question should not be, uh, from a Hungarian perspective, why Europe is in this situation, but more accurately, why Europe is in this situation once again. Um, I would like to uh, lead you uh, to my conclusions and prove my hypothesis through three stages, uh, the first of which deals with uh, four crucial environmental factors that do not necessarily affect um, the, the uh, risks against individuals' lives for exercising free speech and uh, endangering the benefits to societies that free speech affords, but nevertheless they produce environments in which these threats continue and cannot be challenged. Uh, secondly, I'd like to deal specifically uh, with the issue of conscience uh, and risk and uh, the various risk profiles that we develop at Discourse and how we seek to mitigate against these threats in individual cases. And I'd like to uh, go on by dealing with three individual case studies uh, that prove the hypothesis by focusing on three uh, European countries, concluding with a brief discussion on the status uh, of Hungary's future and that of the EU. So let's deal with the first two environmental factors. First of all, it's essential to indicate that a discourse we reject these notions of extremism and radicalization. I am of the view that, as with Islamism, these terms are essentially strategies for not having to name dangerous ideas. So with dealing with the factors, what we are really focusing on is what makes these things dangerous. What makes multiculturalism dangerous? Uh, the first misconception about multiculturalism that is frequently made is that it is somehow different from political correctness. This is quite untrue. Um, when multiculturalism appeared um, into American societies from UN universities at the beginning of the 1990s, it was just generally referred to as political correctness. This was the name under which multiculturalism meant. So it should therefore be understood that one of the essential features about trying to fashion allegedly multicultural societies is to control people's language. Uh, multiculturalism is a political philosophy based on Marxist foundations. There are two issues here. As Hungarians will be aware, anybody who argues against a committed Marxist is called a fascist. Uh, secondly, and perhaps most importantly, basing the action of organizations tasked with public safety um, within a philosophy that is rooted within 19th century rationalism essentially discards every piece of academic development in behavioral science psychology, uh, 
um, psychiatry, evolution, um, all the scientific discoveries, uh, the statistical analyses that are relevant uh, thanks to 20, uh, 20th century scholarship are essentially discarded. Um, religions cannot be solely subjected to cultural analyses. They gain their social significance from being systems of ethics. Uh, systems that decide what forms of actions are moral and immoral, what things are right and wrong. And the most crucial thing that I would like you to take away, I mean, it's been a very long day, so perhaps it's best to front load the most important point, um, is that unlike in the US where multiculturalism began, there is no constitutional backstop in Europe protecting freedom of speech as in the United States. So in Western Europe, we're subjected to both social restrictions and criminal law. What this amounts to in the real world is that in America, say, uh, uh, a police force might have a commitment towards multicultural principles of diversity and equality, but if a police officer notices one social group predominantly raping another, he cannot be fired for raising the alarm because he's exercising his constitutional rights. In Europe, with no such backstop, multiculturalism has been able to run riot. Uh, the second, briefly, is uh, trends in political science, um, moribund Weimar hypothesis. We all know whenever the subject of mass immigration comes up, the usual uh, shibboleths come out about the, the rhetoric of the 1930s. This is nonsense, uh, quite frankly, but it has had significant consequences, particularly when the financial crisis um, when security agencies were relying on the scholarships of individuals like Professor Matthew Goodwin in the UK or Professor Cass Mood in the United States who saw radical Islam and nationalism as two sort of codependent um, entities that could be individually dealt with each other completely ignoring the relevance of demographic factors. Uh, but fundamentally, this way of thinking is just refuses to accept that Europe has the most complex political history in the world and no century has ever resembled the one before. Um, next, let's deal with Islam. What is it about Islam that makes, uh, that is dangerous? Well, first of all, I choose this word Mohammedanism, uh, Mohammedanism um, on purpose because it allows almost immediately for an understanding of why the issues concerning Islam are so intractable. What our political leaders essentially want uh, Muslim leaders to do is to deny and say that conduct, behavior engaged in by the Prophet Muhammad is un-Islamic when this is impossible. It is the life of the Islamic Prophet Muhammad that gives the word Islam its meaning. Also, it is relevant uh, to to say that Islam is an extremely complex phenomenon that has been going through a, a, a literalist revival for a century. There's also an argument to say is, is Salafism, this most literal uh, desire to emulate the behavior of the first three generations of Islam that within 120 years conquered two-thirds of Christendom. Um, is this becoming an orthodoxy uh, amongst European Muslims because of the funding by Gulf states of centers of worship? Uh, understanding um, Islam is based on uh, an, an appreciation of the fact that um, analysis within Islam is really jurisprudence and not theology, not uh, argument, but trying to define what is the correct thing that the example led by Muhammad's life seeks to indicate. Uh, there are deeply held traditions of deception which seem alien. Uh, to uh, uh, conventional European conventions, uh, conceptions of religion and violence. They are essentially theological licenses to commit murder against non-Muslims within the Quran for the crime of just being Muslims themselves. Why is this relevant? Well, it's relevant uh, because there in every single community, be it Muslim or non-Muslim, there is a certain percentage who is psychopathic. And for such individuals, these licenses to commit murder are an opportunity for, for them to say to themselves that they are God's chosen. And if you look at Western European populations, prison populations, this point is amply proved. It's thanks to these populations that we have prisons in the first place. Um, and naturally, there are the profoundly different conceptions of gender value uh, for those who seek to um, hold out hope in the reform of Islam. There are some, uh, Raymond Ibrahim, Dr. Mark Jury, who argue that this um, explosion of what is called radical Islam, Islam is an indication that this reform process is already other way. And it's also a very theologically illiterate point because there has been no 
a major religious reform, just think of European history, that hasn't been accompanied by an enormous amount of bloodshed. Um, the final element is the idleness of the press. Um, let us be frank, in post-religious Europe, there has been a tendency for the press to behave as moral guardians, not objective um, investigators, particularly when it comes to religious issues. Um, there is an unwillingness to penetrate the issues of motivations, particularly within uh, Muslim spokesmen. Um, the easiest way to illustrate this point is what happened to Hungary during the migrant crisis. I, I spoke to many Hungarians who were profoundly shocked at the extent to which the Western press were fundamentally lying. They were misrepresenting what was happening in Hungary. They were seeking to um, take the realities of events, remove nuance, and put it within a sort of theatrical framework of villain and victim. And I'm sort of here to tell you that you weren't subjected to special treatment. This is what has been happening in Europe for the past 20 years. The realities of what mass immigration and Islamization have brought are being systematically concealed there. Two, um, there are very few exceptions to this rule. The Gatestone Institute um, is one that I would certainly recommend to you. It has a commitment uh, to uh, rigorous uh, investigation and evidence. It also has a uh, exceptionally unique focus on European events. I would highly recommend the scholarship of Soren Kern if you want to understand what the consequences to Germany have been of the enormous migrant influx. Um, so a little bit about Discourse, founded in 2010, very small, uh, 15 staff, but we operate throughout the European Union. I found it is essentially because of a realization that free speech was disappearing so fast that the only practical way of preserving it was to ensure that people who exercised it lived longer. Um, the sources of prosecution are fundamentally EU in origin. Um, the European Union is implementing the United Nations' is re replacement migration agenda, which seeks to fix the problem of aging European populations and the welfare state by importing millions uh, from the third world. If you want to know the figures, um, according to the United Nations, the European Union should be importing 9 million migrants every year um, this decade. Um, in uh, preparation for this goal, um, opinion crimes in the European Union were formalized, um, uh, formally harmonized in 2008 by something called the European Council Framework Decision on Xenophobia and Racism. It doesn't define what xenophobia and racism are, but it certainly does define what the punishments are, up to two years imprisonment is, is, is a standard uh, sentencing option open to judges. Uh, these became uh, transposed into legislation in 2010, which is one of the reasons why Discourse was founded in that year. Um, our assessment of risk uh, essentially comes down to the recognition that prison is the most dangerous place for any Islam critic to be because of the aforementioned level of fundamentalists um, within prisons. And also uh, mitigating attacks is primarily about location and force of numbers. Um, we also have an extremely powerful leadership at the very top of the European Union who is, uh, which is very sympathetic towards uh, political Islam. You could Google a, sp a speech made by Federica Mogherini in May of this year in Brussels. And there's an also a really um, a truism that many Islamic advocacy uh, organizations have a far better understanding of how European law is brought about than many Europeans do themselves. Um, dealing with risk profiles as we've defined them, there are three essential categories of risk. This is a, a standard, if you're involved in risk analysis, this is a, a standard risk pyramid, so the, so the higher we are, the greater of risk of death. Um, the, um, issue, uh, the individuals who face the greatest risk of death are Jews and converts, individuals who choose to leave Islam. It's very little understood that most people who do choose to leave Islam, they almost invariably become Christians. Um, religion is very, very important to Muslims, and jumping to atheism is too great. Um, many essentially come down to a quiet night where they compare the life of Muhammad with the life of Jesus Christ and make a condition, uh, make a decision, but that essentially does mean that they often face death from their own families. Can't really talk that much about these because it's confidential. Um, the, um, the, the, the second element is those who meet the discourse criterion, those who have threats or violence coupled with prosecution, we'll be examining those later.
And finally, uh, there are individuals who are involved in government agencies who cover up what is happening, who run uh, risks to their own careers for speaking out, and uh, we're involved with such individuals as well. So let's deal with the issue of rape. First of all, these are the um, elements within our hypothesis. According to a member of parliament re uh, wi within the last year from the north of England, an estimated one million English children have been uh, raped by organized uh, gangs of Muslim males. This is an, essentially a profit-making industry in the UK. Local mo Muslim politicians have been involved, and, it's, and it is an indication, really, the nature of this crime, how it involves brothers, how it involves cousins, how it involves Muslim co-workers. It is clear that this is an ethical issue. The individuals who are do it have a very deeply grounded belief that what they are doing is not wrong. It's been covered up for over 30 years, um, we should perhaps consider that one of the reasons that, w that makes this um, an, a criminological issue that is hard to get rid of is the Islamic conception of the perfect heaven. Uh, parents have been arrested for trying to save their children. There have been horrendous things you don't really want to know about, but literally rape is about to happen and the police arrive and the father arrives and the, and the police arrest the father. This is an indication of the kind of psychological behaviors that we've observed within that third category. The more that individuals are required by multiculturalism, by these speech codes, not to address grave issues, they tend to overcompensate by pursuing the native population. Um, there are various reports that have come out that we've contributed to that indicate the cultures of denials within the police force. Senior police officers just, just don't want to believe that it is happening. Uh, teachers, social workers, journalists are fully conscious. Now, um, et al., the UK is just one example. You can look at Sweden. It's not specifically children, but it is Muslim rape. Uh, rape has um, uh, increased by 1,400% uh, since mass immigration from Muslim lands. You could look at Norway. You could look at Denmark. And you, if you think this is a Western European phenomenon, you are very much mistaken. There was, uh, there's a case currently prosecuted, being prosecuted in Graz, of a school child who was uh, gang raped by five African migrants in a school dining hall and the teachers heard the screams and did nothing. They didn't intervene. This is multiculturalism in practice, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but the key question of um, imposing silence is that when we do so, when we do ban free speech, we immediately become blind to the scale of the issues involved. So one individual, um, perhaps the most notorious that we have been involved with, is an, uh, a fellow by the name of Tommy Robinson. Um, his cousin uh, was raped and he founded a protest movement. Essentially it was an act of revenge uh, by Robinson. He sought to punish police by organizing protests up and down the country with the in English Defense League, um, which caused, um, I think, the last demonstration that he, he, um, he organized in Tower Hamlets cost two million in policing. He's a very shrewd man. He understood that basically this was all about money. Um, what makes his case most fascinating from our perspective is that we shouldn't really be involved in it. He's been prosecuted over 20 times. He's had two extended periods of imprisonment. Not once has he been in charge with a speech crime. Not once has been charged with exactly the crime that the entire society accuses him of, which is inciting racial hatred. And so there's an argument to be made there that if these, these claims were tested in a court of law, then the reality behind them would be exposed, which is exactly why police weren't interested. He's also an indication of the truism that when uh, governments pass anti-terror powers uh, to deal with Islamic I immigration, he, he's been essentially treated like a domestic terrorist. These are invariably used against people who protest um, Islam. He was denounced by the Prime Minister. Um, David Cameron said... Um, at Prime Minister's question time, only recently, um, he said the words, no one could have predicted the Islamic State. Well, that's quite funny because for five years we've been trying to deal with people who've done exactly that. Um, there's also an enormous amount of evidence um, that the government has essentially had to try to have him murdered in prison. Um, so although the individuals we often deal with are accused of incitement to hatred, essentially what this comes down to is incitement to suicide. They engage in comments that risk their own lives and government organizations are not willing to expend the expenditure necessary to protect them. Um, it's also very striking that uh, for apologists for Islam almost automatically associate criticism of Islam with incitement to violence uh, 
um, which is if you've actually read the Quran, um, that is actually what happens. Criticism of other religions presages a violence against them. But of course, any country, all the countries in the world that have freedom of religion are all based on not nobody's religious belief being subject to criticism, but everybody's religious beliefs being subject to criticism. The pillaging of Germany, ladies and gentlemen, the reality is that millions of migrants are robbing European taxpayers with the assistance of their governments. Uh, to begin with, the migrant crisis was deemed to only cost Germany 5 billion euros that they had a surplus to deal with. Then within a few weeks, it went up to 12 billion for a year. Then it went up to 32 billion for a year. The most latest figures that I've seen is that it will take 1 trillion euros just to deal with the influx this year. That's a third of Germany's economic output, ladies and gentlemen. Um, when people seek to exercise their political rights to object to what their governments are doing, uh, racism is used to invalidate them. Um, it's a way of saying, you're immoral, you don't have a right to hold this opinion. Um, Merkel and the EU both have been pivotal in ensuring that such comments, such views are fundamentally censored uh, through social media. Former Stasi operatives are being used um, in Germany to target dissenters to this policy. The most crucial point of view, uh, a point from my perspective here, is that there are essentially two reasons why opinions are restricted and why government seeks to do so. The first is the desire to prevent unrest, and the second is presenting the spread of information and ideas that people will be convinced. The reality is, however, whatever means you implement, either legal or otherwise, to restrict freedom of speech, there's no way of discerning which, which, rationale, is being, uh, 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 which rationale is being forwarded. Um, Heidi Mund is a particularly notable German case. We've involved a very passionate Christian lady um, who was disgusted by the transformation of churches in Germany and they're, they're being taken up as centers of uh, worship for Muslims instead. She decided to uh, run the Pegida branch in Frankfurt, which is not like the massive ones in Germany. Very, very tiny, only about six people. Um, she was relentlessly targeted by uh, violence and intimidation by the left, as were her neighbors. I would very much like to stress that almost entirely the majority of the people that we deal with, um, when it comes to genuine violence, they face it far more from the political left than they do Muslims. Muslims will engage in threats, but when it comes to actually engaging in violence, the political left are much more likely to do so. Now, because this was a, uh, an individual motivated by religious conviction, and it really didn't matter what was done to her, um, uh, the mayor of Frankfurt just basically sidled up to um, Heidi, the employer of Heidi's husband in the Frankfurt Opera House, and had him sacked. Um, so they lost their home, uh, targeting people financially is very much a, a key um, element. Perhaps it can be argued um, on the evidence of the migrant crisis that the accusation of racism is perhaps the most political, powerful political weapon in history. Let's merely think about it. A few decades ago, in order for millions of military-aged males to illegally cross a European frontier, it was usually necessary for them each to carry a gun. And now, every 100 or so needs to carry a child and the press of European own countries will literally use this term, use this accusation, to have the borders erased. Um, the new French terror. Um, there are various um, uh, surveys that relate to the support uh, within the growing demographic, the youth demographic that is increasingly Muslim um, in, in France and their support for the Islamic State. Um, I think it's particularly striking how quickly so many arrests and so many were raids and some mosques were closed so soon after the state of emergency was declared in France and after the Paris attacks. The authorities had these lists, as no doubt the British authorities do. But because of the climate, because of the culture, it's merely necessary for a sufficient number of people to die first before the authorities take action. Um, nobody um, pointed out to the crucial factor linking both January's attacks and November's, that they both happen primarily in a very small area of pa Paris where secularism works and m Muslims become increasingly secular. Um, this was really the target. Um, in both cases, fundamentally, um, the issue of no-go zones, I think previous speakers have, 
have pointed to how um, these uh, formed the foundation of, of, of where terrorism eventually leaves out for. And yet, going back to the issue of the press, the press continues to deny these, these even exist. Um, I would argue that the evidence is overwhelming that the relationship of institutions concerned with public safety in this century is, indi is indicative of genuine Islamophobia. We'll, we'll deal with that um, later. And the demographic realities that um, the, the coming years are pointing to and the taboo truism that you increase the number of people who follow Islam in your country, you increase the number of people who are willing to murder in its name. I mean, it's, it's not particularly uh, problematic. However, the majority of the people who are going to fight for the Islamic State are individuals who were born in the 90s. This Muslim demographic has shot up since then. So this really is only the beginning. Um, and what we are seeing is the growth of European police states to deal with this issue. Um, the measures applauded uh, that were introduced by Francois Hollande after the Paris attacks are truly terrifying and wide-ranging. And I think this is what we're going to see progressively happening more and more. Christine Tassin is one of the people who we've successfully kept out of jail, one of quite a few. She was a school classics teacher, uh, subjected to rape and violence threats, even by rappers. People were convicted of wanting to have her raped and decapitated. She was last prosecuted for objecting to a, an issue of Islamization in a small town called Belfort. A large abattoir, a slaughterhouse, was set up in the middle of the town, temporary, so that Muslims could uh, cut the throats of sheep um, and, and goats for Eid. And she objected to this. And three Muslim organizations ensured that she was prosecuted. And also the court was intimidated by a gang of about 300. She had to be driven away. Um, at high speed, she speaks about every three months to the French security services. This, this is the level of threats uh, against her. But these, the, the actions of these Muslim organizations are crucial in the UK. They've largely been funded by government funded intended to tackle terrorism. And their answer after every single terrorist attack is always, always the same. It's never lay down your arms to fellow Muslims. It's always lay down your words to, to non-Muslims. And when Christine sought to highlight these issues, after Charlie Hebdo, when the Holland government was seeking to turn, uh, exploit them politically, naturally these were banned. So Islamophobia, the most common accusation really of the individuals that we deal with. But a phobia, ladies and gentlemen, is not a fear or a hatred. It describes a pathological unwillingness to confront something. It is not an occasionally a moral characteristic it is an almost universal trait in European political institutions. When someone has a phobia, when they are confronted by an issue, they cannot help themselves but run away. And this is the main reason why we are where we are. So, in conclusion, uh, with respect to the European Union, um, there is a timeline for the Islamic State. They want to get up to quite a lot of nonsense in uh, 2016. I think we've talked about the Islamization of Western Europe and how the populations of Western Europe are going to change profoundly over the coming decades. The populations of Eastern Europe are not. I don't think it's really credible to think the, United, uh, the European Union is going to survive um, under those circumstances. So really how I would analyze, I'm a political analyst professionally in the city, is 2015 is really a compression if you zoom back from, from uh, European political history in 2015, we've sort of compressed the direction in which we've already head, uh, we are already heading uh, much, much quicker. And to uh, be as glum as possible, I suppose, the, the opinion of the vast majority, uh, the consensus view, I'll name no names, no names, no pactrel, of individuals who we deal with is Western Europe is not only that there's going to be a civil war in Western Europe as a result of these issues, but the, the Muslims are going to win it because they have a more cohesive uh, sense of identity than most Western Europeans do. Specifically relating to Hungary, you are at a crossroads. Um, a century of political ideologies invented um, in Western Europe, fascism, communism, these were authored in Western Europe and they ended up decimating Central Europe and Eastern Europe, and Hungary in particular, 
And now multiculturalism and mass immigration stare striking, striking uh, similarities to these ideological predecessors, how opponents are treated. They are heretics, they're considered mad, they're considered pathological. So it's essentially up for you to choose. Are you going to join in the latest, or are you going to see how things work out? Shokshikert. <laughs>